Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you here. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. All right, I think it's time to get started. Uh, again, very good morning. And I know uh, some of us are still coming in. Uh, so we'll get started anyways. And uh, just wanted to remind everyone that uh, this is going to be recorded. Uh, so the recording will be made available on the website, uh, the Chambers website, and also on our YouTube channel. So in case there's anyone that is missing any part of this, you can always go back and take a look at it. Uh, so good morning, uh, Rakesh Naidu with the uh, Windsor Essex Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'm the president and CEO here. And, uh, you know, today's topic um, is, is very timely, TMT predictions. Uh, this is uh, sponsored by VTech Alliance and Deloitte. So thank you, VTech Alliance. Uh, thank you, Deloitte. And, uh, and this is also being offered in partnership with uh, some of our Partners in a region and outside a region, uh, the Windsor Essex Economic Development Corporation, Soar Innovation, Chatham Kent EcDev, Tech Alliance, and the London Economic Development Corporation. So, as you know, uh, you know the province has uh, reopened, or most of it has reopened. Uh, for those that have reopened, congratulations! Uh, I'm sure you know uh, your community is looking forward to uh, to you know getting back to some level of normalcy, and, and businesses are really longing you know to get back to business and uh, and again you know connect with uh, clients customers and open their doors uh, for business unfortunately in the windsor essex region uh, we are still in stage one uh, and i know that is concerning for a lot of businesses here uh, we hear you uh, yesterday there have been a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails uh, to the chamber uh, expressing concern that you know that we haven't yet moved to stage two so we uh, recognize that it is very difficult and i understand that every day is a long day for businesses uh, so on your behalf we are advocating very strongly uh, to have windsor essex region move to stage two uh, and your concerns have been passed on to uh, the province uh, to the highest level and uh, we're continuing to work and advocate very strongly so that we can get to stage two at the earliest and as important as it is, you know, to get to stage two, it's equally important uh, that we maintain social distance. We take care of all health and safety guidelines. Uh, and even when we do get to stage two, it will become uh, more important that we comply with all the guidelines from the health, uh, uh, from the uh, local health officials. Um, everything that we are doing to get to stage two, and once we're in stage two, will be completely undone if we are not taking care of health and safety guidelines and ensuring that, you know, the business is opening safely. So please do your part. It will be even more important as we go forward. And to say that, uh, you know, COVID-19 has been very disruptive, you know, would be, would be definitely an understatement. Um, while it has been very disruptive, it has also uh, given tremendous opportunity, opened up doors for innovation, uh, opened up doors for adoption of technology. And, the sheer volume of technology that we are all dealing with, uh, interacting with, that is phenomenal. Uh, the adoption has just been expedited over the last few months. Whether it is, you know, online shopping, whether it is, uh, you know, delivery of products uh, using robots, whether it is digital and contactless payments, whether it's working remotely and using all kinds of technology like Zoom that we're using today, uh, whether it is distance learning, which most of the education institutions are now um, uh, utilizing and going forward, there'll be a lot more in terms of distance learning or whether it is, you know, going to uh, meet with your family physicians uh, via telehealth, you know, meeting your doctor virtually. Uh, there is so much that we are now uh, making part of our lives. It's becoming uh, more and more common for us to use technology as we carry out our lives. So this topic is, is very timely because, you know, what is it that, what technology is it that we'll be using in the days to come? 
uh, I think everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to find out what is happening. Why, how are we going to deal? How are businesses going to deal with uh, the recovery phase? And how can we use technology so that we can quickly bounce back and get to uh, the road of recovery? So uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, our expert, uh, our key speaker today. Uh, and, and he is very well known. Uh, but Duncan is, is someone that has uh, many people have heard uh, in the past. Uh, I unfortunately have not. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from him. And um, I am also um, you know, encouraging everyone here to, to ask questions uh, because this will be a presentation. But right at the end of the presentation, there'll be time for you to ask questions and uh, feel free to use the chat box uh, you know, or, or send your questions to the Q&A. We have received some questions in advance, uh, so we will be going through that, uh, but uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go uh, forward with the presentation. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to our partner and sponsor, uh, WeTech Alliance. So Yvonne Pilon, who's the president and CEO is here with us, and uh, I will pass it on to her. And just to quickly, before I do that, quickly go over the agenda. Uh, we will have a few remarks from our, uh, some of our uh, partners here, and then we will get into the presentation. And once the presentation is done, uh, we will get into the Q&A for a few minutes, and then we'll wrap up. So with that, uh, Ivan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning, Rakesh, and, and welcome everyone. Normally, uh, annually, I get to look out into an audience and see so many friendly faces. So at least I can see a few here, um, uh, part of our panelists. So We Tech Alliance has had uh, the absolute pleasure of working with Lloyd for close to a decade and bringing Duncan Stewart to the community to share his TMP predictions. And this may come as a surprise, but this is the first time uh, that Deloitte has actually modified their TMT predictions. So I like everything, this, there's a first time for everything. So I'm gonna keep things short this morning, but as we look to the road ahead, um, you know, Rakesh talked about the, you know, that COVID-19 has really catalyzed technology adoption. But as we look to the road ahead, we tech like our partners in Chatham at Soar Innovation and in London, we know the critical role that technology startups and innovators are going to play when it comes to the recovery. In fact, uh, together with the, uh, I guess, the support of Libro Credit Union, uh, Pillar Nonprofit, Tech Alliance, Communitech, and WeTech, we've launched the Recovery and the Rebuilding the Region Design Challenge. So if you are an innovator, entrepreneur um, on this call, you have the chance to uh, bring $20,000 to your collaborative technology focused idea that's really aimed at helping the recovery of the economy. The deadline to apply is tomorrow. So make sure to follow Tech Alliance, WeTech, or any of the partners on social to learn more of that. So in closing, I just want to thank the Chamber, Rakesh, for hosting today's session, and also all of these Southwestern Ontario partners that really joined uh, to put this session together in just a, a snap. And again, Duncan, um, I look forward to seeing you every, 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 every year. So as I said before, I've purposely picked my tea coffee cup today and I look forward to learning um, about bikes because I'm having an issue finding a bike and I think you have a prediction that would uh, align with that. So um, thank you very much. And I encourage you to connect with Duncan on LinkedIn. And again, he's such a wealth of information. All right, with that, uh, we're going to, Kapil, we're going to uh, pass it on to you. Um, sorry, it's Christina, I'm sorry, it's Christina. Good morning, everybody. I'm following on Yvonne's incredible energy. I'm Christina Fox from uh, Tech Alliance of Southwestern Ontario. I have the great privilege of being the CEO of the organization, a place for dreamers, innovators, and world-changing ideas. As the province of Ontario's Regional Innovation Center for London and Southwestern Ontario, we're really focused on building tomorrow's globally competitive innovation economy. So today's topic is just perfect. Um, not only that, we are, we're interested in supporting and enabling entrepreneurship to spur accelerated growth, to attract ambitious talent and new companies. And through our advisory services, much like WeTech and Windsor, we have an accelerator and experiences like today um, that we're committed to founders and companies who are launching and scaling and, and globally getting ready to take on the, the greater market for themselves. Truth be told, the future of work uh, is here right now. And I, it looks to me like all of us on the call are making the future of work 
work for us. So I'm really looking forward to the predictions this year. I too am really curious about the bike. I know I've got mine out and with our new downtown location in London, there'll be lots of bike riding for us as we continue to explore and support our vibrant downtown. So of course, we're delighted to partner with each of the colleagues on this call from across Southwestern Ontario and our friends at Deloitte to present this highly anticipated 2020 TMT predictions. Thanks so much for including us. Thanks, Christina. And uh, Kapil, uh, over to you. Thanks, Rakesh. Uh, good morning and welcome uh, to TMT Predictions, how COVID-19 has changed expectations. Uh, my name is Kapil Lakoti. I'm the president of the London Economic Development Corporation. And uh, LEDC also has had the pleasure of working with Deloitte uh, to support this great event uh, for many years. Now, as someone who has enjoyed uh, his insights on technology, data, consumer behaviors, global trends, and many more uh, insights that have come together in a relatable manner, it is my pleasure to introduce Duncan Stewart. Duncan is the director of TMT research for Deloitte Canada and a globally recognized expert on the forecasting of consumer and enterprise technology, media, entertainment, and telecommunication trends. He has been co-author of Deloitte's annual predictions report on trends in TMT since 2008. As part of his predictions roadshow, he meets with over 100 of the top tech, media, and telecom companies globally every year and incorporates their insights into his presentations. He presents regularly at conferences and to companies on marketing, consumer trends, and the long-term TMT outlook. Duncan has over 30 years of experience in the TMT industry. As an analyst and portfolio manager, he also provided research or made investments in the entire Canadian technology and telecom sector and won the Canadian Technology Fund Manager of the Year Award in its inaugural year. In his time as investor, he deployed a cumulative of $2 billion of capital into global TMT markets in both public and private companies. He is a CFA and holds a BA in political science from the University of British Columbia. Really, really excited uh, for your presentation this morning, Duncan. Welcome. Thank you, Kapil. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, anybody else out there. Uh, uh, really appreciate uh, everybody being able to join. Uh, can I just make sure that everybody uh, the, in the speakers, can everybody hear me and so forth? Give me a thumbs up. There we go. Good. Great. So TMT predictions, technology, media, telecommunications predictions for 2020. Uh, as Yvonne mentioned, this is actually the first time we've ever modified the mid-year uh, for fairly obvious reasons. As I go through, I will be providing COVID-19 updates on each of the predictions I talk about. Uh, and I wanted just to uh, kind of give you my, my core assumptions that underlie those. Now, these are global numbers, but uh, obviously uh, Q1 bad, Q2 worse. Uh, we're, we are optimistic. The signs are, are kind of coming in that it's not going to be the worst case or even maybe the medium case. It's now looking like actually our best case scenario may be the one that comes true. Uh, so we're looking for about an 8% drop that's global. Uh, number will probably be a little worse here in Canada. Uh, smartphone sales are uh, down massively, just, just massively in the first, you know, during the lockdowns. Uh, we are anticipating we see a bit of a bounce, but still down 15 to 20% for, for the year as a whole. And obviously, given the size of the smartphone sector, which I'll be talking about, that matters a lot. Critically, of course, in the uh, media and entertainment space, advertising spending is down a fair bit. Uh, not a whole lot of people running uh, travel ads in the last, uh, last quarter. Um, so that's going to be an issue as well. We're looking for ad spending down 5 to 10 for the year. Once, once again, of course, that varies enormously by market. So let's get going. The first topic I want to discuss is uh, something called private 5G networks. Now, now it's a little complicated to describe the difference between a uh, public 5G network and a private 5G network. So hold on to your hats. This gets kind of technical. So is everybody ready? Okay. Now, a private 5G network is, is very much like a public 5G network, except it's private. I know, I know, you're shocked. It's hard, hard to understand. Um, I'm kidding a bit, but not much. All the technologies are more or less the same. Public 5G, private 5G, it's more or less the same. The difference is that in a private 5G network, a, a hospital, a university, a car manufacturing plant, a defense base, a, an office building, a company like Deloitte, builds their own private 5G network. It's a cellular network, usually working hand in hand with Wi-Fi. Now, why would a company do this? Why is this so interesting? Why well, haven't we had private networks before? 
Now, in order to understand this, I kind of want to take everybody back a long, long time to the 1970s, back when enterprise voice communication was so important. And how did, how did companies do enterprise voice back then? Well, you could just call to the overall network. Uh, that had certain advantages and disadvantages. Or you could install something called a private branch exchange or a PBX. Um, this was a little baby phone switch that replicated the phone switch that sat in the public switch telephone network, but it replicated it on your own customer premises, on your own company's premises. Now, why would a company do that? Well, there were a number of advantages to having a PBX back in 1975. It was more private and secure. If you look at this picture here, if you see these nice ladies with the headsets that sort of look like mine, I guess, um, those nice ladies um, were able to uh, listen to the voice conversations that came through their switchboard. They weren't supposed to, but it did happen sometimes. So uh, as you can guess, a private network is more private and secure. It can also be cheaper over the long run. The upfront costs are, of course, a little bit higher, but, but over five or 10 years, it, it usually ends up being less expensive. Um, uh, PBXs were more reliable. Uh, if you lost a link to the outside world uh, in the old PSTN architecture, nobody in your company could talk to each other anymore. Whereas if you had a PBX, you could keep uh, chatting at least inside your factory or your office. It was faster. It was much quicker to dial phone numbers than to, to go out through the externals. And it had extra features like, oh, uh, uh, automatic call forwarding and uh, uh, phone number dialing, uh, hold music, all that kind of fun stuff. In 1975, no company in the world yet had a digital PBX. By 1995, all companies had a digital PBX. The advantages of having a private voice network were so compelling that it literally captured 100% of the medium and large enterprise market globally, creating tens of billions of dollars of sales and value. Uh, in the same way, we are expecting private wireless, specifically private 5G networks to do really well. What kind of industries are, are using these? Um, uh, these this, is, this slide shows you some of them. Some of them are fairly obviously like mining. You have to have a private network underground. Public cellular doesn't reach that far. But other things like container ports, warehouses, manufacturing, construction, um, two that aren't on here, uh, fairly obviously uh, uh, military is growing as well. And we are also seeing a lot of electrical utilities. Uh, that's an interesting one. That was a bit of a surprise to me, but electric utilities have been all over this. And of course, medical hospitals. We'll talk more about that in a second. Here's our update on private 5G. Our original prediction was that there'd be more than 100 pilots or trials of private 5G uh, by the end of the year. Whoa, were we ever low? Already in the first quarter, uh, more than 130 uh, private 5G tiles have started across the world, uh, across multiple industries. Um, so we've now taken our prediction up. Uh, this is a uh, possibly uh, as a result of COVID-19. Um, we are now saying there could be up to a thousand trials by the end of the year. Now, it's still early. These are still trials. This is not a multi-billion dollar industry yet. Nonetheless, uh, the adoption of private networks is certainly uh, growing faster than we originally thought. Uh, are there COVID-19 tailwinds there? I think so. A um, couple of examples uh, that I've, few examples that I've seen so far. Um, one of them, uh, factories, factories that have been shut down due to COVID-19 and aren't making cars, for example. Well, that's just a perfect time to stick up a couple of uh, 5G radio antennas and test out private 5G and see how well it works. I've seen at least a couple of trials that seem to be taking advantage of factory shutdowns. The logistics and warehouse space, obviously highly stressed as the shift to e-commerce and delivery uh, has replaced physical retail. Uh, so massive shift there. Um, it's hard, though, inside a warehouse uh, to have workers too close to each other. Uh, using private 5G uh, allows for greater use of automation and robots, and I'll be showing you that in a second. Uh, but that's certainly, I've seen a couple of trials that look like they were accelerated in, in that warehouse logistics space. Final one, hospitals. Uh, fairly obviously, when you've got hospital equipment uh, moving from room to room, potentially is a vector of infection. And the wires that come along with those is an additional vector. It's faster, easier, and uh, less need for infection if they're connected wirelessly uh, over 5G. So we've seen at least one hospital trial uh, that may have been accelerated due to COVID-19. Okay, so that's private 5G. Next topic. If the most important topic in telecom is 5G, and it is, uh, the most important topic in technology is AI. Now, as always, when I say AI, I really mean machine learning. So we're talking about machine learning, training, 
inference, uh, algorithms, all that good stuff. Uh, machine learning, AI, is the most important technology today, critically important for a growing number of companies. Uh, where do they, where do, where do companies, by and large, up until now, use AI in the cloud? Why, why in the cloud? Because this was the hardware that did the machine learning training and inference. Um, you can see these things are hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of watts, uh, weighing hundreds of pounds. This only fits inside a giant mega scale hyperscale data center you can't put this on a uh, tablet a robot a camera a sensor uh, or a smartphone now let's talk about edge computing which are smaller cheaper chips that uh, are less powerful but nonetheless are capable usually not of machine learning training but on machine learning inference so just as a reminder what happens is you get a very large data set you do your machine learning training on it you develop an algorithm that algorithm then makes predictions on smaller slices of new data uh, those that that those predictions are called inference uh, and that's that's the the the, the knife edge of, of AI and machine learning, the inference portion. These chips are capable of doing inference. Let me walk you through what that looks like. I'm going to start off by doing a, what they call a virtual teardown on a smartphone out there. This is the 2019 Samsung Galaxy S10. Uh, $420 worth of parts inside that uh, device, of which the central processor, uh, which is called an applications processor modem in the smartphone world, costs about $70, okay? Now, here's a picture of that, uh, that central processor, and I'm going to wave my little mouse cursor around. I hope everybody can see that. This is what's called a die shot, and what we're doing is we're looking at the approximately 20 billion transistors on this chip uh, by functional area. Right here is the core, the processor core, the sort of effectively the CPU. Um, uh, that's the A75, A55. Uh, you've got main memory. You've got cache memory. You've got the GPU. GPU is the graphics processing unit. Uh, that's the thing that makes your video and gaming look so great on your screen smartphone. But there is a new thing in smartphones, and you can see it over here. It's called an NPU. Now, NPU stands for a neural processing unit, and it's a small portion. It's about 5% of the die. It's worth about three and a half bucks. It's a dedicated portion of the chip that accelerates machine learning inference on the phone itself. It's a special dedicated little tiny processor. Here's, a, here's another one. This is a, a Huawei chip. Uh, you can see they've got a bunch of uh, different GPUs and so forth, but down here at the bottom, there's your NPU. They've got a neural processor as well, a little smaller this time. The old Apple A12 Bionic, this is last year's chip, uh, you can see has, a, has an NPU down here on the left. And if we look at the A13, this is the most recent Apple chip. This is what you'd find in the, in the latest and greatest phone. You can see the usual thing. You know, you've got cache memory, you've got processors, you've got GPUs, and then you've got a dedicated portion, about 5% of the die or about a $3 chip that on the latest greatest Apple chip is in uh, dedicated to accelerating machine learning. Now, at this point, everybody's eyes usually start rolling back in their head and they say, can you give us an example of what these chips might actually do? Here's a good one. This is a photo I took of my wife, Barbara, uh, last summer. And uh, um, I'm going to just use my little mouse. I hope everybody here has the screen picture nice and big. And you can see the picture of Barbara quite clearly. You can see her nice blue dress uh, with the pattern on it. If you've got extraordinarily good eyes, maybe you can see the rust here, the carving on the door. Heck, maybe even the red straps on Barbara's sandals. All of which is not that impressive on a smartphone picture these days, right? I mean, phones are great. What if I told you this photo was taken at 10.30 at night with the only source of illumination being a single street light about 20 meters away? Uh, to the naked eye, I couldn't even tell Barbara was wearing a blue dress. Well, how does that happen? Well, just like with traditional cameras, what uh, my phone did is it held the lens open for about one and a half to two seconds so it could capture as much light as possible. But I move a little bit. I can't help it. Barbara moves a little bit. This photo should be completely blurry. Why isn't it? Because the AI inference, the NPU on my phone, subtracted my motion and Barbara's motion from the hundreds of photos it took, it combined them into a, deep breath here, single, full color, high resolution, unblurred, nighttime photograph in real time. It only took about one or two seconds of processing to do this, all without even being connected to a network. 
This is a feat of computational photography that would have been difficult for NASA with the supercomputer 20 years ago. This is just a remarkable thing and it costs three bucks and it's on every single high-end phone out there. So that's just an example. Now, there are other NPUs out there. This one is from January of this year, introduced at Las Vegas at CES. This is the Cintia Neural Decision Processor. It's much, much smaller than the uh, one on a smartphone. It's less powerful as well, but it's also much cheaper. This doesn't cost $3, this costs 30 cents in volume. Now, it doesn't take pictures or process pictures. Instead, it does voice. Uh, it can do a wake word and maybe a short list of 30 or 40 commands. Hold that thought, hold that thought, because that's gonna get real relevant soon. There's other uh, out there. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the British company ARM, A-R-M. They're the world's leading uh, designer of semiconductor cores for third parties. And uh, they have just introduced their Ethos U55, which is like an NPU. Uh, as you can see, uh, compared to the previous generation, which was only a year ago, uh, it's 50 times faster uh, at speed to inference, and it uses 25 times less energy. Folks, if you're familiar with Moore's Law, Moore's Law says, oh, chips, uh, chips get twice as fast every couple of years, or maybe they use half as much energy every couple of years. We are talking about one-year improvements that aren't doubling or four times or eight times or 16 or 32. We are at literally, you know, Moore's to the sixth kind of annual improvement at edge AI machine learning neural processing, okay? Now, our original prediction for the year was that we'd have about 750 million edge AI chips, chips on, on phones and speakers and wearables and, and other devices. Uh, we said about 750, uh, and our long-term forecast was about 1.6 billion. Well, needless to say, we've had to update that. Why? Well, because there's fewer smartphones selling. If smartphone sales are down, and they are, that means fewer edge AI. As you can see, of that 750, two-thirds, two-thirds of those came in smartphones. So if smartphone sales are down, edge AI is going to be down this year. There's nothing you can do about that. What about long-term? What about long term? Let's go back. Let's go back. Let me just talk a little bit. Remember, remember that uh, the camera stuff, the nighttime stuff I talked about. What if I put an edge AI chip on a camera that did facial recognition on a, oh, I don't know, an automobile plant where the workers checked in but had to wear masks, so you couldn't actually you couldn't actually see the lower half of their face. That would be a heck of an AI challenge to just recognize people from the eyes up. And then I want to combine that maybe with the thermal image to detect if they're running a fever and are potentially infectious. So there is just an example. Think about cameras at the gates of automobile plants uh, that need to check in thousands of workers at shift change in a very short period of time using AI on the edge because it's faster and it's cheaper. And if the net, I mean, imagine if the network went down and you didn't have this on the edge device, people couldn't come into work anymore. So really important there. Now think about maybe inside that same auto plant. There's all kinds of buttons people got to touch. I don't know about anybody else out there, but I've become averse to, you know, touching, touching buttons. Uh, so picture voice command inside factories wherever possible. And that's where those little tiny 30 cent uh, processors may come in. In short, on edge AI, massive, massive, massive topic. I think 2020 is going to be a little light due to smartphone weakness, but I think my 2024 number probably isn't going to be 1.6 billion. It might be 6.6 .6 billion. COVID-19 is going to dramatically accelerate the need for edge AI, for, for visual, for voice, for all kinds of applications, uh, lots of medical applications there as well. So putting those two topics together, let's spend a second talking about robots. The little orange arm you see there is what's called an industrial robot, and the little carts are what are called professional service robots. Historically, when we talked about robots back in 2016, 80% of the market was robot arms. The professional service robot was real, real small at that point. However, those service robots have been growing much, much faster than the robot arms. Our original prediction was that we were looking for, in 2020, for the first time ever, service robots to actually be bigger, to sell, sell more units than uh, robot arms. Well, we've had to uh, revise that. If you look at where, uh, where uh, the professional service robots are, uh, logistics, inspection, defense, medical's not even on here, but it was there as well. Here's an example. 
this is this is a this is a real thing. Uh, it is not a tanning bed. Uh, it is an ultraviolet lamp, uh, which is uh, an autonomous little robot, and it goes from a, a hospital room to hospital room when nobody's in it. You can't do it when people are inside, and it disinfects all visible surfaces of COVID nineteen or any other bug. Um, it's not there. There are there are dozens or hundreds of these going out to hospitals. Uh, they are also found in shopping malls, uh, hospitals. Uh, I mentioned hospitals, airports, airports. They've been using them to disinfect airports. Uh, and I've also seen a few in use in office buildings. Putting that all together, we've had to revise our robot forecast. Uh, we originally looked for plus 30 uh, for service robots and plus 10 uh, for uh, other robots. We've had to change both. Professional service robot sales are just surging. Warehouse logistics, medical, we're, we're seeing them. We're seeing them there. Um, uh, the other one that we are seeing, though, is that industrial robot sales are weaker. Uh, as you probably know, uh, those uh, uh, the single biggest user of uh, professional, uh, sorry, of of the uh, 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 industrial robot is the automotive sector, and everybody here knows uh, ca Canadian auto sales in uh, it was either March or April were down seventy five percent. So uh, a weak time for the automotive sector. Hopefully, it comes back. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but uh, right now, um, that's hurting. That's hurting sales of robot arms. One of the things I want to talk about, uh, let's shift gears away from uh, tech and factories to uh, consumers and media. One of the new things that's going on out there is something called AVOD. AVOD stands for Ad Supported Video On Demand. This is not SVOD. SVOD, like Netflix or Disney Plus or Amazon Prime. SVOD, everybody knows about. You pay money and there's no commercials. AVOD is sort of the opposite. You don't pay any money, but there are commercials. Now, this has up until now been really a big thing in China, uh, just huge. Uh, China and India, uh, uh, just the numbers found there, as you can see, absolutely dwarf the number of people that you would you would see on an SVOD service. So uh, uh, really big growth in, in Asia Pacific, um, but growing, growing in North America as well. Hulu, uh, Peacock just launched in the States. We've got Roku, Tubi, Pluto TV, millions there. Um, what does all this mean? Well, putting it all together, we had forecast originally, we've had to revise it, which I'll get to in a second, but we had originally forecast nearly 50% growth to 32 billion this year. Uh, and the really interesting part here was if you look down here, was that that growth was being led by North America. It's not, it's not the largest yet, but certainly it's the fastest growing. Uh, Europe may even be higher than we thought. So we are seeing significant growth in advertiser, uh, ad supported video on demand. Uh, the reason that North American growth matters so much is that all Although the numbers of people in India and to a lesser extent China are, are large, the revenue per user per year uh, were quite low, uh, 84 cents per year in India. So you can see even if you've got a lot of users, that doesn't add up. Meanwhile, in North America, the people, the ad value, if somebody in North America is, is watching an AVOD channel, their value per year is, is around about five bucks a month or uh, more or less $60 a year. So you can see that those growth in North American users really matters from a dollar perspective. Uh, what, what are we doing with AVOD uh, in the light of COVID-19? Well, usage is up. More and more people are, of course, when working from home, studying from home, locked down, they watched a lot more video. So we actually saw uh, both the number of users of AVOD uh, be up a lot worldwide and the number of minutes of viewing that they were watching was up a lot. So uh, both of those are good things, but the problem is that they still have to sell ads and ad spending is just down. We talked about this already. Uh, no Summer Olympics, that's going to hurt. Uh, no sports that hurts. Uh, there's just, just across the board, we've had to trim our prediction just a little. Not a lot, uh, but we've taken it from 32 to just under $30 billion. But still, big industry, long-term, Long-term AVOD does better than ever. Uh, one thing I should mention is that we're starting to see data from, oh, multiple countries, the US, UK, India. Uh, as countries emerge from lockdown, we're seeing an interesting trend. So during lockdown, both traditional TV, uh, plain old TV, uh, as well as over-the-top services like SVOD and, and AVOD, uh, all went up an amount, 30%, uh, 40%, call it whatever. Interestingly, by the end of lockdown, traditional TV viewing had fallen to roughly where it was at the start of the pandemic, up maybe a little. But I, I guess some of it's news, right? People just, there's only so much COVID news that people can watch. And in the early days, they watched more, and now they're kind of fatigued about it. Uh, meanwhile, the AVOD numbers, although they're not quite as high as they were, remember they were up about 40%, they're hanging on to more of their gains. So if they might have been up 40 at their peak, they're still up about 20 to 25, whereas 
traditional TV, which was also up 40, is now up three to 4% or maybe even flat in, in one market, uh, actually down. Um, so uh, I think our long-term prediction for AVOD remains just as strong as ever. Next topic, antenna TV. Now, this is terrestrial TV antenna. This is not a satellite dish. A lot of people thought this was gone. It is not. Uh, when we look around the world, there are uh, roughly 2 billion people who get some or all of their television from a terrestrial TV antenna. Uh, even here in North America, and I'll talk more about North America in a second, but uh, even here in North America, it's a fairly big number, about 44 million people. Um, what are some of the biggest markets? Uh, so yeah, emerging economies like Indonesia, India and Nigeria, but also Japan and uh, the US and Italy. So uh, it, it, antenna TV is a, a big thing in, in lots and lots of places. Um, want to talk a little bit about some selected markets here. I specifically want you to focus on the ones on the left there. Um, so the uh, UK number, uh, 44%, that's actually up in the last the five years, in the last five years. Not a lot, but a percentage point or two. The US number, 13%, is up 48% since 2011. And the Canadian number, 15%, uh, has nearly doubled since 2014. Uh, what is happening is that people uh, what we're seeing is that people are cutting the TV cord, cutting, cutting, paying for the traditional TV bundle, uh, and some of them go away and don't watch any traditional TV anymore. But some of them are cutting the cord. And remember, in the U.S., cable TV costs like a hundred. Five hundred, ten dollars per month. What they're doing is they're cutting that cord, and then they're they're just going. Uh, and during COVID, you could have done this. You go go online, go on to uh, Amazon, order a digital antenna for thirty, forty bucks, install it yourself in a window. This doesn't even need to be roof mounted if you live in the right part of the city, and you can get in the states especially thirty to forty channels of uh, high quality TV for free forever. You got to watch ads. Actually, at some level, if you think about it, uh, uh, AVOD is the new antenna TV or antenna TV is the old AVOD. It's, it's the same deal. We will give you free TV, but you got to watch ads. Now, uh, so we're seeing some growth there. Uh, one thing I do need to point out, watching ads, why does this matter so much? Traditional pay TV has a fairly high per, uh, number of minutes uh, that are time shifted. And of course, some of that time shifting is people ad skipping. Advertisers don't like it when you do that. Uh, meanwhile, people who have antennas almost never use a PVR, DVR, so they can't ad skip. So as an advertiser, when you put ads on traditional broadcast television that people watch with a, a TV antenna, uh, they're seeing Seeing all of your ads. I mean, they might get out of the room, get go, get up out of the room, or put it on mute or something like that. But at least you know the odds are are better. So uh, we were sort of intrigued by this whole antenna TV thing. Um, what do we say about our numbers? Globally, no difference. 1.6 billion uh, is such an enormous number that you can't really move the needle on it. But I will say that based, uh, this is more U.S. than Canada, but I, I'm pretty sure I'd see the same trend, uh, same trend in Canada. We're starting to see cord cutting uh, in the U.S. in Q1 was much, much higher than anticipated, nearly double. Uh, still, I mean, it's a couple million homes, but we believe that a significant number of those are actually putting up TV antennas uh, instead of cutting. So they're they're still watching some TV. Uh, they're just watching it terrestrially uh, rather than than through a cable package. Another media topic, uh, audiobooks and podcasts. We, uh, we were looking for growth in both of those this year. Uh, we had some nice numbers there. Uh, what's going on? Oh, I, I wanted to put those in context first. So although we are looking for both audiobooks and podcasts to grow, you can see, and this is our forecast numbers, uh, those are, the, uh, none of these have been revised. So the, these, this, this is all the original shot. Uh, we haven't had a chance to revise all of these. But uh, in comparison with the other parts of the media industry, still pretty small, pretty niche. How have we uh, modified it? Well, this is actually an interesting one. For those of you out there who've got kids, you probably are way ahead of me on this one. Audiobooks are actually tracking ahead of our expectations, almost certainly for kids. I mean, if you're mom and dad and you're trying to work from home with young kids uh, who aren't in school or daycare, uh, getting, a, getting a, a, a speaker to read them a story on an audiobook is a pretty, pretty useful way of keeping the kids distracted. So audiobooks may actually be a little bit higher than we look for. And that's, that's interesting. Um, podcasting on the other hand down and you're kind of like well why that doesn't make any sense i'm listening to podcasts uh, during lockdown all the time and i bet you are 
but are you listening to as many podcasts as you used to sitting in your car stuck in traffic? And the answer is across the board uh, worldwide, no, we are actually looking for podcasting sales to be down as uh, fewer people spend time in cars. Podcasts were always heavily, heavily consumed while driving. And as fewer people commute, uh, we've had to take our number down. I'll talk more about our expectations on cars and commuting and podcasts a little later in this, in this uh, presentation. But I wanted to uh, just kind of touch on the fact that, that not only is it fewer people listening for fewer minutes, the other thing is, of course, 75% of podcast revenues are not subscriptions, they're ads. The ad markets are down. Bad ad markets are not good. So we've had to take our, our podcasting number down a bit. It's not going to crack a billion this year. We're going to be a little under that. So long term, long term, still love podcasts, still love audiobooks, but but uh, 20, uh, 2020 down for podcasts. One of the predictions that we had made uh, at the start of this year was that we were looking at something called the smartphone multiplier. The idea was that the sales of smartphones uh, for the year uh, are about 400 and some billion dollars. And then there's another 460 billion dollars of, of other stuff that goes along with it. This slide shows it almost perfectly. I'll just walk you through this one. So original forecast for smartphone sales was 484 and then another 459 million of things like mobile advertising, apps, games, videos, subscriptions, earphones, uh, all of that kind of stuff, getting very, very close to a trillion dollars. However, as a result of that decline in smartphone sales that I've already discussed, we've had to trim our numbers. So our, our number on smartphone sales comes down a fair bit over $73 billion to 411. Uh, that has a big drop in mobile ads as advertising is off. Mobile ads are off too. Uh, interestingly, apps more resilient. They're down, but just a snick, just a snick. Meanwhile, the accessories. So as you can see, we've gone from a nearly trillion dollar market to a still very healthy $830, $840 billion market. But uh, long term, I would say that within a year or two, I would expect the smartphone ecosystem, that the stuff that isn't the smartphone itself will in fact be larger than the sales of the smartphone hardware itself. The Everything else that goes along with that ecosystem is going to grow even faster. Next topic is low Earth orbit uh, data satellites. Unlike the satellites in geosynchronous orbit, 36,000 kilometers up, these are only about 400 to 1,000 kilometers up, much, much closer to Earth. The disadvantage of that is you need hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of satellites to cover the entire planet. The advantage is you can usually get higher speeds, but critically, much, much lower latency. Uh, that's the time it takes uh, for a signal to go from, you know, from me up to the satellite, down back to uh, somebody on Earth, then back up to a satellite. That, that round trip time when you use geosynchronous orbit can add up to uh, uh, one, one and a half, two and a half seconds of, of latency, not milliseconds, actual seconds. So on stuff like a, like a Zoom call, wow, that, that latency would just drive you crazy. Uh, you couldn't use a VPN. There's all kinds of reasons why geosynchronous is, is, has its, its virtues, but it, it's just not good enough in a lot of applications. So um, real drive uh, to provide these low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, why now? Uh, Getting into orbit is much less expensive. Launch costs are down about 90% from uh, 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. Um, the, uh, the, the satellites themselves, they're, they're cheaper, they're smaller, they're more modular, it's easier to make them. Uh, it, you can make 50, 60 at a time. It used to be sort of onesies and twosies. And then there's the demand for data has increased. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go slow, I gotta slow down because I'm talking a little fast here. What we're looking at here is a lovely chart from uh, the uh, Global Wireless Alliance, uh, the GSMA. Uh, they put this out. Uh, this is data for 2018. And what you're looking at here is uh, three different uh, markets. The uh, green market is people who are currently connected to high-speed mobile broadband. Uh, you know, that's uh, LTE and so forth, super high speeds. Yay, that, that's great coverage. 24%, uh, I'll get to that in a second, but 1% in North America, 1% of people in North America live in what they call the, the, the coverage gap, right? These are people who live somewhere where there is no signal, just none at all. And, and that at first was kind of what people thought was going to be the market for these low earth orbit satellites. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to stay slow. So 
1% North America, that's 5 million, that's, that's okay. Worldwide, it's much bigger, about 10%, that's uh, 750 million people live somewhere. But a lot of them are in markets that may not have a lot of discretionary income for data. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia is like half, uh, 520, uh, 520 million right there. That doesn't seem like that big a market. So now I'm going to talk, uh, hopefully, Canadian to Canadian, uh, and discuss a, a little bit about what's going on, especially with maybe with COVID-19. So I want to talk about that North American number there. You see 75% of us are connected, 1% of us uh, are, are live somewhere where there is no connection, and 24% of us in North America uh, could be connected but aren't. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why. Now, fairly obviously, some people just don't want to be connected, and that's fine. That's their right. Uh, some people, it might be an economic thing. Maybe they can't afford connection. But another part of it is going to be the quality of coverage. So uh, I'm going to share with you, I did a speed test uh, here downtown. I live in downtown Toronto. I did a speed test yesterday on my phone, and I got 111 megabits down, and I got, uh, I think it was uh, 53 megabits up. No, sorry, 33, 33 up. So uh, 110 down, 30 up. The definition in North America of rural mobile broadband coverage is 10 down and three up. And, and I want to talk about 10.3. So I've got 111.33, which is lots and lots. If I am attempting to work from home during COVID, if, if, I'm, if I'm a dad and a mom and a couple of kids and mom is on her Zoom webinar and dad is on his Zoom webinar and the two kids are on their Zoom webinar trying to learn, there is no way that three megabits per second up is going to be enough. There's no way that 10 megabits down is going to be enough. The point I want to make here is that the, the, the need for speed in rural and suburban areas as a result of COVID-19 is understood to be significantly higher than we used to think. We used to think 10.3 is like, fine, oh, you can get your emails and some web surfing and maybe even watch an SVOD service. But when you've got multiple people relying on connectivity to do their work from home, learn from home, uh, consume from home, get medical from home, uh, you, you just need higher speed. So, I think COVID-19 has demonstrated that the market for rural edge of city data is bigger than we thought, okay? I'll skip that slide for a second. So we had predicted uh, originally that there would be more than 700 satellites in low Earth orbit uh, seeking to offer broadband up from 200 at the end of 2019. We are now predicting over 1,000 LEO sats. Uh, one of the providers, OneWeb, uh, already has 68 satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, more importantly, Starlink, uh, by the way, I need to, I should have updated my slide. They just had another launch earlier uh, last week. Uh, they are now at uh, 360 plus 58. They're now at 418 satellites with another 60 expected to go uh, next week, uh, which will take it up to four, nearly 480 satellites uh, just, just by the end of June. Um, so the what's going on is, uh, oh, and Canada's Telesat uh, is looking at this market as well. Uh, what we are seeing is, I believe, directly as a result of COVID-19 demonstrating the importance of high-speed data everywhere, I believe we are seeing an acceleration in the deployment of these low-Earth orbit satellites. That will mean more service sooner. Um, one thing, though, that I should stress the prediction is that by the end of this year, when service begins, we will have small uh, pizza-sized electronically steerable antennas that will not cost very much money as ground stations. And that'll be great if it happens. But I haven't seen one of those yet. They're not for sale. And if that doesn't happen, this is the kind of ground station. You can see this kind of gimbal steerable. So I should, I should clarify. When you've got a geosynchronous satellite, it sits over the equator and it never moves. You can use a, like a $30 antenna here on the ground, point it at one place on the sky and it, it fine, it works perfectly well. These low earth orbit satellites, they zoop across the sky really quickly, 10, 12 minutes horizon to horizon. So you have to have an antenna that either physically or electronically can track these satellites as they go across the sky and then pick up the next one when it comes over the horizon. That's a, that's a hard thing to do. Maybe there'll be a $100 pizza sized dish by the end of the year that's electronic 
electronically steerable. But for now, this is what people are using to access low Earth orbit satellites. And these, uh, these kinds of uh, gimbaled uh, uh, satellite dishes, this is about 60 centimeters or about two feet across. Um, these things cost like $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, which suggests to me that in the early days of low Earth orbit satellites, this is going to be less about individuals getting access and more about enterprises. Uh, think about communities, mining camps, oil rigs, planes, trains, boats, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's in the early days. Longer term, longer term, I'm sure it goes consumer, but uh, at least for now, uh, I think it will be more enterprise. Oh, uh, quick prediction. Oh, I actually haven't spent much time talking about this, but there's a kind of thing out there called a CDN, a content delivery network. It's like a, a data center for content. This is for latency and bandwidth sensitive content like video and gaming. You want to locate that stuff as close to user as possible, not thousands of kilometers away, not hundreds of kilometers away, but tens of kilometers. So these little baby data centers, content delivery network, CDNs, uh, we had predicted would reach 14 billion this year. We're actually taking that up. Uh, we're thinking it, its growth will be 30 to 40 percent. It's probably pull forward. This is this is money that would have been spent on content delivery networks in 2021 and 2022. Instead, it's all going to happen now uh, because there's uh, accelerated demand for video and gaming. So we expect our CDN number to be a little little higher than expected. Final uh, final prediction for this year. Let's talk about let's talk about biking. Our prediction is that technology is transforming the way that bikes work, and some of that is sharing, some of that is apps, but a big part of it is e-bikes. Now, if anybody out there, this, this is not these electric scooters that you uh, sit on, you know, the ones that look like little mopeds. This is a pedal assist bike. And if uh, I've been talking to people around the world about these and every single person I've spoken to when I, I ask, how do you like your e-bike? Say, I don't like my e-bike. I love it. Uh, it. It doesn't mean you don't get a workout. You still have to pedal. But instead, you go further. You go faster. Hills are flatter. You sweat less. Uh, it's just a tool that the people out there who have it just seem to adore. Um, it's not, of course, just about commuters riding e-bikes. Uh, it can also be used for getting groceries around, kids around, delivering stuff, uh, replacing trucks inside our city. So we're seeing e-bikes uh, being heavily used in delivery uh, around the world. Singapore is, is moving very fast on this. Putting that all together, um, what we are expecting to see is that although there will be significant growth in the number of electric vehicles out there between 2018 and 2023, as you can see, the fleet growing to about 15 million elect fully electric vehicles by, by 2023, that's completely dwarfed by the number of e-bikes and the number of e-scooters out there. This is just a, a game changer. Um, I, sh I should go back for a second, just showing you this bike. So this kind of bike, this kind of bike used to cost, oh gosh, Canadian three, four, five thousand dollars only a couple of years ago. You know, you really couldn't find anything for under Canadian twenty five hundred in an e-bike. You can now for Canadian a thousand bucks get a perfectly nice e-bike. Now that is a little more expensive, of course, than a, than the old fashioned mechanical bike, uh, but still it's not a ridiculous premium. One of the other things, and I have an article that I published uh, yesterday on the Deloitte website. Um, we are seeing an acceleration in cycling. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more in one second. Um, but we are seeing, as I put it, a, a bike spike. Uh, more people around the world are cycling to work. Uh, we are seeing that bike sales are through the roof. E-bike sales are through the roof times two. Uh, most bike stores, in fact, are sold out. Uh, it's, it's almost even a crisis in terms of getting, 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 getting uh, bikes out there. We are seeing significant, significant growth there. Why? Now, here comes a little bit of bonus material. This was not originally part of our 2020 predictions, but this is some work I did and have been uh, following up on, and I'm writing some articles about this. So this is uh, data from a survey in China done in February as they were just emerging from lockdown. As you can see, there's very significant growth in China in the use of private cars uh, post-pandemic, uh, nearly, nearly doubling. Uh, Two-wheeled vehicles, that would be bikes and motorcycles. Motorcycles are very popular in China. Uh, but bikes and motorcycles, still fairly high, but no change there. Um, uh, bus metro transit down more than half. Taxis down significantly. Car hailing down significantly. Why? What's going on? People don't want to share 
a vehicle with a single driver who might be coughing and sneezing, and they certainly don't want to share a bus or a subway car with 60 or 200 of their closest sneezing, coughing, non-face mask wearing friends in a closed environment with poor air circulation. Uh, the fear of infection from transit is a thing. I've got numbers. So this is Chinese data, but I got it everywhere, uh, just here in China. You know, the number one reason that people were interested in driving uh, was, uh, was uh, fear of infection. Uh, lack of trust in public transportation is strengthening purchase intent. Uh, Two thirds of people want to purchase a car within six months. I think this is kind of relevant for the Windsor Essex area. I don't know about you, but I have a funny feeling that we are not only going to see an automobile snap back because of pent up demand. If people didn't buy in March or April, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll buy later. I think you're also going to see a lot of people who historically have relied on taxis, Uber or transit saying, I don't want a shared vehicle, I want my own. Um, we might see a significant surge in the purchase of new cars due to this factor. So this is Chinese data, but I've got exactly the same data globally. I've got it for the US, I've got it for Canada. I can, I can run it for any country you want. Uh, we are seeing this trend around the world. Uh, some of, by, uh, by the way, uh, okay, well, I'll talk about this. So here we go. This is data from a city in China. This is from last week. And what we're looking at here, I've got my little mouse. So uh, uh, the orange line is congestion from last week. The dotted orange line was the week before and the gray line was the year before. And what we're seeing here is that in almost every day of the week, traffic levels in China, in this city in China, are higher than they were pre-pandemic. It makes sense. If hundreds of thousands if millions of people who used to be in shared vehicles like buses, subway, taxis, uh, Ubers, that kind of stuff, if they're not on that anymore, they're on the roads. And if they're on the roads all at the same time, that means rush hour is now worse than it was before. So um, I'm just going to I'm just going to lay that out there right now. Well, let's think about that just for a second. If people spend more time in 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 cars and traffic jams are worse, think about the impact that'll have on work from home policies. Uh, think about the impact that'll have on companies wanting to stagger the hours that people work. Think about the impact that'll have on uh, media consumption while people are in those cars. Uh, lots and lots and lots of things, most of which I'll, I'll hope to get to in the Q&A. So there we go. We're exactly on time. Lots of time for questions to come up. I do always share this slide. Now, the copy of the slides will be available. We're about to move to Q&A in a second, but I'm just going to put this up here right now. Um, please, if you have questions, do email email me. Please follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, heck, even Instagram. Um, certainly Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I publish article after article about the impact of tech media telecom on office space, on uh, cycling. I just put that article up. I've got one coming on cars in a couple of weeks. Stay tuned for that one. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point. I'm also going to have to put my glasses back on or I'm not going to be able to see the questions as they come up on screen. So I'm going to stop sharing now. There we go. And now I'm going to take a look. I see one question in the queue. So folks, there's both a chat function and a Q&A function. Um, so uh, uh, I've got a number of questions. I also have some questions that came in on email. So I see that there's one question from Nancy Creighton already on low earth orbit satellites, one web and receivership. What is your prediction for them? I don't know what's going to happen to one web itself, Nancy. Uh, but, uh, you know, those are assets. Those satellites are up there. Plus they've got spectrum. Uh, they've, they've got a raft of spectrum around the world that's uh, needed, uh, to do a low earth orbit constellation. We'll have to see. I suspect somebody's going to buy those assets out of receivership. I don't know who We'll see. Uh, Starlink. Uh, Starlink is testing this summer. They're testing kind of now-ish, but uh, larger tests I expect to see more actually like in the in the fall. Uh, I have heard that the receiver is going to be 300 US. I've actually also heard $100 US. Nobody knows. Uh, they have absolutely, Starlink has said that they will have a cheap, affordable, electronically steerable antenna about the size of a pizza box, but it's not out there yet until I actually see that. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 I am no, no guarantees, no promises for me. I'm now going to take a look at, uh, uh, some, some of the stuff in the chat function. Um, 
where are we here? Uh, PowerPoint, will PowerPoint be available after? Uh, 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 hang on, I'm trying to see, these are largely not questions. Sorry, this is mainly just chat back and forth from the panelists. Okay, yeah, sorry. So questions, um, I have to go, oh, hang on, here's another one. What's the advantage of private 5G versus Wi-Fi? That's from David. Thanks, David. I'm just gonna click answer live. Um, so David, uh, Cellular is not best efforts, Wi-Fi is. Now, in most of the private 5G trials I've seen, people are frequently using both private 5G and Wi-Fi combined. Uh, for the things that Wi-Fi is suited best, uh, you use Wi-Fi. But on the other hand, if you want really fast latency, guaranteed service, uh, uh, network slicing, all kinds of uh, higher density. There are a number of reasons why private 5G or 5G in general uh, is different than and superior to uh, Wi-Fi. Um, but it's usually a hybrid solution. Most people are looking for both. But for example, in a mine underground, people are going private 5G only. Uh, you, don't, you don't use Wi-Fi down there. So uh, that answers that one. Now, there were some questions I had online. I've got to go find those because I have them in a, a different folder. Uh, so I had a series of four questions that were submitted in advance. I'm just reading those now. Uh, so what software do I see becoming dominant in the meeting area during 2020? That's a great question. Uh, it is unclear to me. So uh, as you know, back in the days of the early 1990s, we saw this kind of winner take all phenomena where a single company dominated, oh, web browsers or, or uh, productivity software or operating systems. One player would fairly rapidly go to 90% market share. Uh, it, winner take all, winner take most kind of thing. It is unclear to me if we are going to see that in terms of enterprise collaborative video tools like the one we're using now. I mean, I'm gonna name names. You've got, uh, let's see, there's Microsoft Teams, there's uh, Cisco WebEx, uh, there's uh, Zoom, uh, there are others. Uh, I've used a bunch of these so far. Uh, as far as I can tell, there is no clear winner take all yet. It, it, it so far appears to be a, uh, a market with multiple winners, all of whom are growing. Fairly obviously, as we move uh, out of lockdown and back towards at least some people working from the office some of the time, uh, we may see uh, less use of this. That tends to mean the market will consolidate around a few leaders. Uh, it is unclear to me who's going to end up winning that. Uh, I just don't know. Great question. Don't have the answer. Another question I see is, will COVID uh, combined with low oil prices, slow the drive to electrification? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I certainly would. So when we look at fully electric vehicles, they tend to be, they tend to, sales tend to slow a bit when the price of oil drops. Uh, I'm not, I'm not supporting this. I'm not, I'm not endorsing it. I am merely commenting that this is a thing that happens over and over and over again. When the price of oil drops, North Americans especially move to less fuel efficient vehicles. We tend to buy more trucks, more SUVs, uh, more minivans. Uh, uh, we move away from smaller cars towards generally bigger cars. This is a pattern going back decades. Um, given that the price of oil is down, I would expect that the increase in electric vehicle sales will, it won't necessarily go negative, but I do think that low oil is generally a headwind for electric cars. The other thing that's a headwind is, is double factor, right? If people are making less money, if they're furloughed or unemployed or laid off or, or on reduced salary, that's not a good thing uh, in terms of electric vehicles vehicles, which tend to be at a price premium. The other thing is that electric vehicles, uh, frequently uh, sales have been motivated by fairly substantial government subsidies. Governments have been printing trillions of dollars to support their economy during COVID-19 lockdowns. It would not surprise me if we saw electric vehicle subsidies either not renewed uh, or if renewed, maybe at a lower level. So we'll see, we'll see, but that would be a, uh, that will be a, uh, I think it's another headwind. 
another question I see, uh, how will we see integration of COVID test kits and contact tracing apps into everyday tech and in home? I, I haven't seen any of that at home. Uh, there will be certainly stuff like that uh, at workplaces. Uh, we are Deloitte is working on that as a prediction topic for 2021, but I, I haven't seen much on the at home test kits and contact tracing apps. So uh, uh, not a lot there. Uh, can't answer that one in detail. How will COVID-19 impact universities as well as international travel is my last question from, uh, from online. Great question. So um, let me, let me answer a little bit about kind of, Three buckets here. Ben Evans, great guy. You should follow him online. He's got a newsletter every week. Benedict Evans. Uh, ben Evans used a phrase that for years now, we've been talking about things like uh, shopping, getting groceries, buying groceries online from home. But relatively few people did that. Uh, we talked about working from home. How easy would it be to work from home? But relatively few people did that. We talked about learning from home. Relatively few people did that. We talked about medical, televisits, doing that from home. Relatively few people did it. During COVID-19, to use Ben Evans' phrase, phrase we have essentially been undergoing a forced experiment. I love that word. Hundreds of millions of people around the world all of a sudden had to try Zoom and see if it worked for school, for business meetings, for webinars. Hundreds of millions, tens of millions. Well, me anyway. I had to try online grocery delivery because I was quarantined and I was stuck at home. And I tried it for the first time. Um, uh, education. Uh, medicine, all of these things. So let's kind of go through what are the options. People might might try it and go, eh, it's okay. People might try it and go, that didn't work. Or people might try it and go, that worked better than expected. Based on what we've seen so far, there are a couple, uh, well, a variety of things that have been complete successes. Uh, a number of people have said that this whole, I don't physically need to go to the doctor for something. Can I just ask him about little Johnny or Janie's sore throat? That seems to be working really, really well around the world. I think the market for virtual doctor visits uh, has, we've done a forced experiment around the world and it works really well. I think this whole work from home thing has worked extremely well. Uh, I think a lot of employees are surprised at how well it's worked. I think a lot of companies are surprised at how well it's worked. Now, I'm gonna answer a question about work from home in more detail later, I think, uh, but I, I wanna to touch right now on the idea that at general, at a high level, it's worked better than expected. Uh, grocery has worked, uh, I'd say it's mixed. Some people seem real happy. I was desperately unhappy. I hated the whole grocery experience. It's not, it's not their fault. But when I was doing it, it was when a whole bunch of people had just come back from spring break in the US and the system just didn't scale. Uh, I, I had to click hundreds of times to even get an order two weeks in the future. Prices were high, selection was low, and they didn't bring me what I wanted. I hated the experience and I, I vowed I'll never use online grocery again. That's me. Some people had better experience, but, but in general, I'd say, I'd say online grocery was mixed. A lot of people would rather go to a store. The absolute absolute total failure is K-12 to education online, especially K-7. to I have talked to teachers and I have talked to parents uh, and their kids hated it, the parents hated it, the teachers hated it. It's almost impossible to get eight-year-olds to learn online. It's just, it's just not working. Uh, we did a forced experiment and I'm going to say right now that was a failure. But the question, Duncan, was not about K-12, it was about universities. Aha, universities seem to be mixed. It's more in the grocery category. There's no question that kids can learn online through digital tools. They learned before COVID-19. Can they do it entirely that way? The answer is yes, uh, they can. Is that the long-term future? That one's unclear. So much of the university experience is the on-campus, the networking, the, the talking, the friendships, the, the people you meet, the overall experience. I, um, I believe that at the right price, now here comes the critical thing. Here in Canada, what are we looking at? 10 grand, Canadian, uh, 10, 12, 15, something like that, not counting residents, uh, for an on-campus experience. Remember in the US, you're looking at, at, at 25, 50, 75 US, not even counting living costs, uh, just tuition. Uh, I believe that certainly around the world, France, Europe, Germany, Sweden, where education is sometimes uh, free, that the physical on-campus thing will come back. People will go back to universities in a heavy way. In a hybrid model, there will be online classes, of course, but there will also be a physical one. 
In Canada, I would expect that as well. The U.S. is a funny one because the cost there is so high. They either need to bring their costs in line or uh, as uh, Scott Galloway talks about, there could be some big changes in university education. Travel, we just don't know. It's too early. I will say that I published an article, oh gosh, three months ago now, taking a look at 9-11. There was a, a big drop, a big drop in air traffic uh, after, right after 9-11. And a lot of people said, we will never again see those peaks in air travel. Air travel. Nonsense. Two or three years later, you had surpassed the 9-11 levels and it continued growing for years. Uh, then in 2008-9, we had the global financial crisis. Air travel dropped and people said, that's it. Nobody will ever travel again. Within a few years, we were once again exceeding those highs. Now, I do believe that the next two or three years for travel, especially air travel, is going to be problematic. However, I do expect to see within five to 10 years levels uh, easily surpassing where we were. We will be sitting like sardines in a can, jammed as close as we ever were, because pandemics go away. Even the 1918-1919 even the uh, the influenza epidemic that killed an estimated 50 million people around the world, uh, much, much larger than COVID-19, eventually these, these, these viruses get out there. We either all have been exposed uh, or we have vaccines and cures and so forth. So my prediction on air travel for 2025 is it will be higher than today, uh, I mean, and higher than 2019. I, I see a, uh, another question uh, here, um, uh, Q&A. Do you see increase in mental issues having in mind that humans are social beings? Uh, that's from Lilia. Great question, Lilia. Uh, yes, we absolutely are. Uh, we have seen absolutely some surveys out there suggesting that the shutdown had some effect. effect. Uh, people miss other people. We are social animals. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I expect work from home, learn from home to be only partial going forward. We are overwhelmingly social human beings. Uh, will there be mental health issues? Yes, there will. But we do need to, we do need to keep this in context. Uh, for example, in the Great Depression in the United States, uh, the death by suicide rate did increase. Uh, it increased a not inconsiderable, I'm doing this from memory, uh, 10 or 20 percent as a result of poverty and so forth. Uh, more Americans annually killed themselves in 1930, 31, and 32. Uh, but you've got to keep it in context. The, the number of, of deaths per year, suicides per year uh, in the US as an example, is uh, a fraction, a fraction of what we have seen just so far from COVID-19. So uh, although I do expect to see additional deaths due to things like mental health issues, those numbers, while sad and tragic, are an order of magnitude. I would expect to see a few thousand more, which is terrible and I wish it was zero. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, uh, uh, it's not something that's going to be uh, another COVID-19. Uh, the virus kills many, many more people than the mental health issues do. Uh, so I, I believe people are, are relatively resilient and, and will come back. But no, there will absolutely, uh, absolutely be uh, uh, some effect there. I see another question from Nancy. With, what, uh, with work from home and overvaluing on uh, commercial office space. What are your predictions? Nancy, please check out, follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. I wrote about this last Thursday. One of the things that we're seeing in the short term is that uh, density needs to fall. You need physical distancing inside the workplace so that let's take a typical company. If a typical company says, well, we're going to have half of our workers in at any given time, not 100%, just half. But if density needs to fall by half, which is almost exactly what we're seeing, if everybody needs to sit twice as far apart, that means that their net need for real estate is in fact unchanged. It could even rise. In the short term, I actually expect to see the demand for commercial office space not fall in the short term. Longer term, once again, uh, once we're able to jam people back in at you know one per hundred square feet or whatever it is, um, that may change. But at least for the next two or three years, I actually see very little impact on the commercial office space market. There's an entire article up there about that. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, I'm fine. I'm going to answer live. Done. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming in live, so if anybody has any, please do answer. Uh, I do want to comment a little bit about work from home. Uh, nobody's, you know, I, I said I would amplify a little more on that. So let's, let's I'm going to give you, some, this is going to be a prediction we discussed in, in 2021. So I'm going to give you some historical data. 
the uh, actual number of Americans who worked full time from home back in 2017 was 5.2%, up from about 3% uh, four or five years earlier. So it's been creeping up for a few years now. Uh, fairly obviously, more than half of Americans did work from home during the lockdown. So that was yet another of Ben Evans' forced experiments. Uh, so that's really uh, a fascinating thing to see. Um, unquestionably, uh, workers, uh, employees and employers have both, to their, I think, very pleasant surprise, found that work from home worked better than thought. Does that mean we return to 100% work from home? I don't think so. I think everybody believes that for most jobs, some going into the office, working in teams, meeting other people is necessary both for productivity, efficiency, employee mental health. We are social creatures. Corporate culture, you just, yeah, it's an important thing to have those water cooler conversations. Although as I joked in my article, maybe we'll all be gathered around the big jug of hand sanitizer going forward, but don't drink it. Um, what I think we will see is a hybrid work from home. So the question isn't what percent of Americans will work from home full time. It's what percent of Americans will work from home some of the time. Now, here comes an interesting thing. We don't actually have great data on what percentage of Americans work from home, let's say once or twice per week. We do know that about 40% of Americans work from home occasionally, but that could have been as infrequently as like once a year. So that kind of doesn't really count. I think the real question is what percent of people are going to work from home, let's say two, three days a week, call it half time. That number, based on a survey we did in the UK, suggests that it's going to be about another 10%. So about 5% of North Americans will work from home full time, about the same as before, maybe up a little. But I think that the percentage who want to and will be allowed to work from home two to three days a week will be at least another uh, 10%, and it could be as high as another 20%. The only thing you got to be real careful about here is there, uh, you've got to look at only the percentage of jobs that are, to coin a phrase, work from homeable. You know, if you are making cars in an automobile factory, you cannot work from home. You have to actually go into the factory. We're talking about things like, oh, legal, office, consulting, accounting, desk jobs, those sorts of things, right? As a percentage of all desk jobs, I would expect 30 to 40% of people to start working from home at least one day a week or more. Uh, there is a uh, link, uh, uh, Gail Robertson posted this, uh, I hope everybody can see that, uh, but uh, there are many local mental health initiatives uh, for uh, uh, issues around here. Uh, one of the ones, uh, yeah, the Canadian Mental Health Association, so it's uh, windsoressexcmha.ca, so uh, obviously reach out there if you are, or your kids or your family are having uh, health issues. Thanks, uh, Gail. I appreciate you posting that. Just on a personal note, I will say I've got four kids and uh, one of them absolutely is having uh, mental health issues around COVID-19 on the uh, substance abuse issue. And I thought like, well, that's terrible and I'm upset about that, but I've reached out to some friends. There's a, there's a bunch of kids out there that are, are certainly having that as an issue. So uh, I'd certainly want to flag that. I was shocked how many, how many currently are going through it. Do you think with an accelerated focus, this is from an anonymous attendee, uh, do you think with accelerated focus on AI, remote work, and gig economy will move more jobs from developed world to developing? That's a complicated one to answer. Uh, thanks, anonymous attendee. That's a, that's a tricky one. One of the things we're seeing is a reshoring trend. Uh, a lot of companies uh, have discovered that with their supply chain uh, being disrupted by COVID-19, relying on getting half of your parts or even one of your parts made three quarters of the way around the world is not actually a very good way of approaching things. And they're trying to shorten and tighten their supply chains, make them more local in the belief that that will make them more resilient. That's a, that's a trend. I could see that also uh, pushing back a little on uh, on having more workers uh, remote. I mean, do I really do I really want people uh, working on the other side of the planet? What if what if the just speculating here? What if the U.S. China trade war goes out of control? I don't maybe I don't want employees somewhere where that could be impacted uh, affected by you know trade disputes. Um, the other thing that I think is going to be real interesting with work from home is uh, if people are able to work from home, 
uh, you don't need to pay Silicon Valley rates anymore. Instead, people can live in the middle of Montana, connect on a low Earth orbit satellite, uh, get a house for 100,000 bucks or whatever they cost in Montana or Saskatchewan, I suppose. And, um, and, and you don't need people to pay downtown Toronto, downtown San Jose uh, prices, right? So uh, one of the interesting things about remote work is it may significantly decrease North American labor costs uh, because you don't need to pay people as much if you, they don't need to live in Silicon Valley uh, or downtown Toronto. So that's a, there's there, uh, two anonymous attendee. Great question. I don't think we know the answer to that one yet. It's a, it's a complicated issue with a lot of moving uh, parts. Um, on that note, uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, I'm going to hold it open. Oh, hang on. Uh, Deborah Livne. Hi, Deb. Deborah, sorry. With remote doctor visits, how will healthcare be impacted in Canada? Well, to be clear, I mean, if, if, you, if you need to go get a physical exam, you're going to continue uh, uh, to see, uh, you're going to continue to need to see physical doctors in presence uh, that. Um, we actually have some numbers on this. So this is the prediction I'm writing for 20, uh, 2021. The global market for in-person doctor visits in 2019, the value of that. Because, I mean, in Canada, even though we don't pay for a doctor visit, it's still, it, there's a cost. There's a cost even in socialized medicine, right? Around the world, my estimate of the market for in person phys physician consultations between patient and doctor is $500 billion per year. Now, if we move that to at least a portion of that to televisits with your doctor for the little Johnny, little Janie has a sore throat kind of thing where you don't need a physical exam, those, those are cheaper. Uh, half the cost, one third the cost uh, to the medical system. I see a potential tens of billion dollar worldwide saving um, here in Canada. That would be smaller, of course, but it, it would be a way of perhaps containing some portion of our rapidly rising and too high medical costs. So I would expect remote doctor visits to be a uh, not pervasive, not universal, but a tool that we use for uh, we use for helping contain medical costs without sacrificing uh, quality of care. Uh, thanks very much. David V has asked a question. How has stoppage in live sports impacted TV and phone usage? Thanks, David. Uh, obviously, uh, it, it, you know, viewing of sports is down a lot. Weirdly, uh, watching of news uh, more than offset it, so we actually saw TV usage rise. That has fallen, but it has fallen before sports has reopened. We have seen only some limited data, largely on German uh, Bundesliga football matches, but audiences, at least so far, have been significantly higher than they were before. So uh, there's obviously a lot of pent-up sports demand. Uh, now, that's because, of course, Bundesliga, it was the only game in town, so lots of people were watching it. Football fans from other countries were just fascinated to be able to watch a game again. Uh, when we've got Premier League opening up, uh, the French uh, League is not opening, if I recall, but I believe Spain is. Uh, we've also got the NBA coming. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but uh, phone usage, uh, interestingly, most people don't watch a lot of sports on their phone. Uh, 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 sports tends to be watched on the largest screen possible. Uh, so uh, phone usage uh, up 40% or so. So uh, thanks, David. Uh, on that note, uh, we are coming certainly close to the uh, end of the hour and end of my voice. I am going to uh, leave it open for one more second. No. Yeah, uh, Duncan, uh, thanks. You know, I do have uh, one question for you. Oh, uh, And sure. this, is, uh, this is to do with facial recognition software. You know, it's been in news quite a bit these days, right? With IBM, yeah. Microsoft, Amazon, all saying that they won't be, you know, um, allowing the use of, of their technology. Uh, but as you mentioned, you know, that there is quite a bit of application, right, for that technology. Uh, it's useful applications. So what do you think is going to happen uh, as regards this particular technology and the usage and the application development? Yeah, this is going to be, that's, Rakesh, thanks. Awesome question. So I, I normally try to avoid politics, but hey, I'll say it online. Black lives matter, okay? They really do. One of the problems with facial recognition technology is that it is a potentially extraordinarily dangerous tool, especially for persons of color. Uh, many of the facial recognition technology sets out there have trained on largely, and I'm pointing at me, 
uh, white blue eyed guys, uh, you know, with high contrast here and all that kind of stuff on persons of color. Uh, it does much less well. And uh, in a, the current environment in the US, but other countries as well, uh, there are significant concerns about law enforcement using facial recognition. And uh, to be blunt about it, hey, this black guy looks a lot like a black guy who did a crime and they approach with guns drawn. Um, too often that has had tragic endings and this is the cause of obviously significant uh, uh, concerns, protests and changes in policing uh, and uh, law enforcement and, and government support of that. For that reason, the use of facial recognition uh, technology in public safety, I think will at least for a while be very, very, very tightly controlled. And I will comment as a person who studies machine learning and has written about it for years, I think that's a good thing. I don't think it's ready for, I think anybody who's got a gun in their pocket, facial recognition isn't good enough yet for, for identifying potential suspects, uh, persons of interest. On the other hand, at an automobile factory, where you have workers coming up who are supposed to be there. Uh, it's maybe a private network. That data is not going anywhere. It's not being leaked. It's not being compromised. When we move away from public safety applications and look at, at private workforce applications, I think there are good and reasonable uses of facial recognition uh, using AI that also have significantly lower public safety, health, uh, people getting shot implications. So uh, I think, think about it as private versus public. Private facial recognition, okay, with caution. Public, go slow. Yellow light, red light, let's be careful, at least until it gets better. Awesome question though, Rakesh. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, one more question. I, I know we've got a few more minutes, so uh, uh, you know, I'll ask a question uh, that is of interest to small and medium-sized businesses. So with every, you know, you know, a lot of things that you mentioned in terms of the technology that's available, what technologies do you think would be of greatest use for the SMEs as, as we, you know, come out of uh, COVID-19? So certainly, uh, for example, private 5G, not so much. The companies that are playing around with private 5G are the ones that are big enough. It was the same, by the way, with PBXs back in the 1970s. It was really big companies that got PBXs first, and then it trickled down to small and medium business. I expect exactly the same thing to happen. Private 5G for small and medium business is a 20, 2030 technology, maybe 2025, uh, Edge AI. Edge AI, everything I just said, is just as useful for small and medium business, uh, if not more so. Uh, robotics, less so, uh, but one that I would absolutely lean on uh, for small and medium business would be uh, low Earth orbit satellites if necessary. If you have a uh, building or a plant or an office or a, a pop-up store where the broadband is not good enough, uh, Leosats could be a bit of a game changer. So that's one that I would certainly keep, uh, keep uh, back in my mind, back in my mind. But edge AI. edge AI. AI is the most important technology of the 21st century. I know we're only 20 years into it, but I'm telling you right now, edge AI, putting the intelligence on the edge device, it's, it's, like, it's like the smart, it's the smartphone of AI. It, it, it puts intelligence in our hand rather than off in the network somewhere else. And that's a, that's a game changer in all kinds of ways. Uh, let's talk about that just in terms of automotive, you know, making our cars smarter, putting that AI in a vehicle rather than having to connect that vehicle to the cloud to make decisions, whether that's about safety or edutainment or uh, predictive maintenance, uh, all of that stuff gets just streets better and that's because of Edge AI. Thanks, Duncan, that's fantastic. Great presentation, very enlightening, uh, just, just amazing. You know, the, the number of topics that you've covered in, in your predictions, you know, fantastic. Um, so thank you for your time. I'm going to pass it on to Alex. Um, Alex has a few remarks. Thanks very much, Rakesh. Uh, thank you, Duncan, for your time. Um, I always thoroughly enjoy these presentations. Once, once again, you've given us a lot to take back and, and think about. Um, I want to quickly introduce myself to the group. Uh, my name is Alex Weens. I'm a senior manager based out of Deloitte's Windsor location. And before we wrap up, I wanted to give a very brief overview of Canada's Technology Fast 50 program. 
So we introduced this program at last year's Windsor and Chatham presentations. So some of you might already be familiar. Um, the goal of the program is to recognize technology driven companies that are having a transformational impact on business in Canada. And the criteria for selecting annual winners is focused on Canadian owned companies with at least $5 million in sales and the fastest growing revenue year over year over a four year period. Um, I was very pleased to see that Race Roster, which is based out of London, Ontario, was on the 2019 winners list. And it would be great for, uh, for the region to continue to see more applicants and representation in the Windsor to London corridor. Um, so for companies with sales that are outside of the uh, $5 million threshold, or large companies that may not see the sort of year over year growth as some startups might, there are other categories. Um, there's the Enterprise Fast 15 for companies with over 25 million in revenue. And also the Companies to Watch category. And, and that category shines a spotlight on rising technology companies with the potential to become future Fast 50 candidates. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about the program or find details about submitting an application, uh, everything you need can be found at fast50.ca and the application period will remain open through the end of July for the 2020 year. And that's all I've got. So thanks again, and I'll turn things back over to Rakesh. Thanks, Alex. And uh, Amy has provided some information on the past 50 on the, in the chat box as well. So there's a link, so please access that. And uh, Duncan, there is a lot of people, a lot of attendees that are, you know, you know saying thanks to you. Uh, fantastic job, you know, uh, a lot of people are saying that how wonderful it is and how informative it has been. So thank you uh, for, for making time for this presentation and uh, you did a fantastic job, you know, explaining a lot of complicated technology in a way that we could all understand. Um, and uh, you talked about NPU. Uh, I needed NPU, which is not the NPU that you know, but the NIDU processing unit, you know, to, to process some of that that you shared. Uh, but thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, you taking the time for it. And I also want to thank uh, VTech Alliance, uh, Iwan, uh, for working with us to make this happen. Iwan, thank you. And for all the supporting partners uh, for working together collaboratively to, uh, to make this event very successful. Once again, uh, thanks to Duncan and the entire Deloitte team. And as I mentioned, you know, this presentation will be made available. Uh, it will be on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. And uh, I just want to uh, remind everyone that tomorrow we, our special guest uh, is uh, Minister Vic Fedeli, who's Minister for Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. And uh, please uh, come and join us. And it'll be your opportunity to hear from him directly, ask questions to him. Uh, you can also submit questions to, uh, to us uh, beforehand uh, by sending it to info at windsorsxchamber.org. And uh, the timing for tomorrow is a little different. It starts at one o'clock, so please take note of that. Uh, so it is from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. with Minister Vic Fedeli. And then on 18th, we have an event that is focused on the real estate industry. Uh, so there's information on that on our website as well. So with that, uh, I thank everyone for uh, being here, for participating in this webinar. And uh, I wish everyone uh, a very good day. Uh, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you, Rakesh. Hi, thanks, Duncan.